All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody that's logging in. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Jason Valdez. I'm the Associate Professor of Art and Gallery Director at Victoria College and coming to you live from the STC Technology Campus Library here in South McAllen. Um, just to give everybody some background information on me, I am an STC alum. I did attend South Texas College way longer than I'd like to admit, uh, way back when. Um, I did some of my basics here. I even took some automotive technology classes here uh, before I finished my bachelor's degree. Uh, I'm originally from McAllen, born and raised. I graduated from Naperville High School uh, back in 2002. And between 2002 and 2007, I was attending UTPA and then STC in the summers. Uh, in 2007, I earned my Bachelor's of Fine Arts with an emphasis in painting and drawing. And after that, I started my career as an art educator. Uh, I spent six years teaching as part of the art department of Mission High School. Uh, it was a great experience. I learned a lot as far as my personal technique as a studio artist, because I had to be that much more proficient in order to be able to teach it to students. Uh, it definitely encouraged me to continue my career as an educator. Uh, so much so that I eventually decided to pursue my master's of fine arts. So in the, the fall of 2014, I made the move to Corpus Christi and I started the MFA program at Texas A&M University of Corpus, uh, where I studied under Joe Benya and Ryan O'Malley, respectively, for printmaking and painting. Uh, between 2014 and 2017, in the graduate program, I learned oil painting techniques, uh, which is what the majority of these works are. I'll talk about that in a little while. I learned some printmaking, which I've got an example of here as well. Um, learned a lot about art theory and art history and uh, got to meet a lot of wonderful people, uh, great classmates, uh, some amazing opportunities to travel and uh, got to go to New York City and I got to meet some artists over there. Um, Chuck, uh, I can't remember his name right now, Charles Yoder and uh, Hugo Bastidas were a couple of the artists I got to meet, really, really great people. Um, and even was fortunate enough to meet uh, Chich Marin at one point uh, during my time as a graduate student when I was there. And uh, later on, he even bought a couple of my pieces. So I was really, really excited about that. Great opportunity. Um, and lastly, I met my wife there. So even better, you know, great, great time for sure. Um, when I graduated in 2017, I was very fortunate enough to get a full-time job at Victoria College, which is where I'm currently teaching now. I've been there going on five years. I'm the uh, professor of two-dimensional foundations. So I teach a range of drawing, 2D design, art history. And uh, I also run the fine arts gallery as well. So what uh, Ms. Gina Advos is doing here, I'm her counterpart at VC. is basically what I do, same thing. Um, so today will be a, Going through the exhibit uh, here, the time and a half is what I call my show. Um, my background is very uh, blue collar, vocational. Uh, a lot of the members of my family are mechanics or they're electricians or they were in the military or they're road workers, some type of vocational trade. And I always joke that I was the one weirdo that went to school for art, but it is what it is. You know, I. I approach it that way. I approach art as my trade. It's my vocation. It's my skill set that I've trained hard and worked with uh, to develop and hone. And, and I don't want to say perfect because I don't want to be perfect, but do the best that I can. And that's how, like I said, I approach it. That's how I treat it. Uh, time and a half, you know, if you're unfamiliar, that's a turn of phrase to refer to, you know, if you're working an hourly wage and you're working more than 40 hours a week, well, your wage goes up anytime you pass 40, so time and a half, overtime. Um, a lot of this stuff is work that I had to do on my own time, hence the title. You know, I wasn't just going to work and ignoring my classes and just working on my own stuff. I mean, I still had to teach and I still had to go to meetings and turn in paperwork and submit grades. So this was on the side. It was just stuff that I did during my office hours or this was stuff that Maybe I was lucky to bring in as a demo piece for my classes, my students, or stuff I worked on over the summers at home when I wasn't teaching a course. Um, so that's where that title comes from. Uh, <clears throat> some of the work is from graduate school. This piece, for example, is a piece I did for my MFA thesis exhibition in 2017. Uh, I got to this idea of building a painting 
you know, because I like working with my hands. I like working with tools, making things, physical objects. You know, it's just something I've always done. And I had this idea of using woodworking skills to build a painting outside of the traditional rectangular stretcher or panel. And so I was using these engine images to kind of symbolize, you know, working class uh, spirit, work ethic, uh, discipline, you know, that kind of thing. And I made these, I made five of these. Uh, some of them I don't have anymore because they're sold, which is always nice. Um, but this is one that still remains, one of my favorites. And uh, it is a depiction of a uh, Chevrolet straight six engine, which was an old, old motor. It was produced for many decades. And they're known for their durability, their longevity, their simplicity. And kind of taking those ideas and then tying it back into my ideas as far as being a tradesman, being an artist, and those being one and the same, you know, that uh, discipline and that willingness to keep going no matter what. Um, you know, that really kind of formulated in my head during grad school because I'll be honest, grad school was extremely difficult as it should be. I mean, that's the idea. It's supposed to test you. It's supposed to challenge you. There was a lot of sacrifice and a lot of sleepless nights that I had to go through those three years, but I saw it through. And so this, you know, kind of informed all that. And so what I was doing is I was carving these pieces out of plywood and building them on multiple levels and really playing with this idea of three-dimensional form and illusion and having parts of the painting pop out having other parts of the painting just be illusionist, illusionistically rendered um, as traditional painting and let that kind of play with light. You know, the way the spotlight's hitting it, the way it's casting shadows here, the way that these elements are casting shadows because they are raised from the surface, you know, and that's a lot of what went into these, you know, and as I said, I, I made five of them and they're bigger than this. I think it's one of the smaller ones that I've got. Um, some of them I even incorporated actual you know mechanical components hoses gears you know things like that uh, these marks here this is actual rust it's not just brown paint i found a iron-based paint that when you add an oxidizing agent it will rust and age and patina naturally just like sheet metal would. so all these paintings have that as this painting ages this will continue to rust and change color and create really really beautiful patinas naturally the way that an old truck body would left it out in the field for 30 years. So that's kind of where this came from. <clears throat> you know, I've always been attracted to mechanical things. And uh, like I said, I love working with my hands. You know, my father's a diesel mechanic. And on top of that, he's a big VW fan, Volkswagen. So growing up, you know, through the years, he had various VW Beetles, and Volkswagen buses and stuff like that. And um, I always have memories of him working on these things. You know, after hours, uh, coming home from the shop he worked at to work on his, his Beetle or his bus, you know, and keep it going and keep it running. And he'd show me little things here and there, kind of taught me some basic general automotive maintenance. And I just like that idea that I can work with my hands and put something together that before I touched it didn't work. And after I, I touched it, it does. Um, other than a couple of classes at Secured STC, I had no formal training in, you know, engineering or anything like that. It's just something I picked up, something I'm attracted to, and I really enjoy. Um, I'm happy to say that now I've been able to get into that hobby myself. I have an old pick, uh, I pick up, I have an old panel truck at home, um, and I actually just spent the last two years rebuilding a motor for that from scratch. I picked up an old junker, brought it home, tore it apart, rebuilt it put new parts into it, restored it, and got it running. Never done it before, but I had a feeling that I could, and I just went for it. Um, so lesson for you guys out there, students watching, if you're ever unsure whether you can do something, you will never know unless you try. I didn't know if I could do it, and I did it. So definitely take that with you guys, for sure. Um, that's actually this piece right here. That's what this is. So this is a digital reproduction. Uh, hopefully the camera's panning over. Uh, yeah, this piece, digital reproduction, it is a larger painting. It's actually about that size, 24 by 30, uh, oil on panel. This is the 
color that I restored. That's how it looks today. It is in those colors. It's got all the chrome and all the bells and whistles, which is really, really nice. Uh, but that's what inspired me to do this piece. My experience, those 18 months, working with this thing that was just rusted over, dirty and grimy, you know, to be able to bring that back to life really was a, a big thing for me, like I said, because I'd never done it before. And so that's where this came from. And the reason this is a digital print is because the original sold before I even finished it. Um, I have an artist Instagram that I post on regularly, and there's a couple of guys that follow me from California that have bought my work, and one of them saw an early progress shot of this and just immediately said, hey man, how much do you want for it? Okay, so we worked out a deal, and with his permission, I have the digital print here for display. Uh, so a big thanks to uh, Victor Sanchez from Fat Fender Classics. Really appreciate that and his patronage. Um, that's where this piece came from. Uh, the one above, that is my actual truck, my 58 Chevy panel truck that I have at home. Uh, this came from a day that I was doing just basic maintenance. I think it was an oil change. And I was on my back underneath letting the oil pan train. And I looked up and this is my view. And I thought, man, that would be a killer painting. So I immediately just snapped a picture of it. You know, and that was something that I was taught early on from undergrad when I studied with Leonard Brown at UTPA was always take photos of stuff. Doesn't matter what you think it is, if you think it's trivial or not, take a good photo of it because you never know what it might be to. That's exactly what I did there. And I think about two years later was when I painted that piece. Oil on canvas, very old school, very traditional, but you know, it, it's personal to me. It's uh, something I really put a lot of heart and effort into and like all these pieces you know that's what gets me through working through them because painting those of you that have painted before you know what i'm talking about you always hit that lull that flat spot where you don't want to mess with it it's not turning out right you're not liking it it's frustrating you feel like you're always taking two steps backwards you have to push through that and one of the best ways to get past that part is to paint something you're very passionate about or very knowledgeable about. It, that interest grabs you and it keeps you going even when you don't want to do it. So, <clears throat> excuse me. so that's where this one came from. Uh, I did some basic still lives. This was actually a demo piece I did a couple of years ago for my painting class one spring semester. And I was showing them traditional oil painting techniques. Uh, my professor, Joe Benia, was really, really big about uh, indirect painting. So I had to do an underpainting in brown washes, and then I had to build all of my uh, build up all my black and gray layers, get that going, and then do very thin transparent color layers to build up these reds and browns and greens. So all this color, it's not just one layer of green or one layer of red. It's multiple layers, three or four different shades of red that I had to build up slowly, put a layer on, let it dry overnight, do another one the next day, and so on and so forth. So that's where that piece came from. I just had these objects in my classroom and I thought that'd be a really cool still life. So I put, uh, put that together. My class painted that as an assignment. I painted it with them. Uh, Cause I'm really big as a teacher about always working with my students. Um, I like to be in there with them. I like to be at the easel right next to them, working on my own stuff, walking around. I feel it's really important because they see me putting work out and it gives them an opportunity to ask, the, ask me questions about what I'm doing. Why am I doing this? Oh, I've got a show coming up. I want to submit to this. Or, you know, I've got a client that commissioned me to do whatever. And it creates a dialogue with them so they can see, yes, you can make a living doing this. Yes, you can find ways to get your work out there. You know, uh, it's not some great grand mystery. It's just putting in the time. That's what it's about. So that's where this piece came from. And due to the uh, industrial nature, I called it uh, working man still life. Pretty straightforward. Uh, this one I did recently, and that was actually based off an experience working on that old truck of mine. Uh, about four years ago, I had to rebuild the entire brake system. And anybody that's ever worked on like an old house or an old car or a motorcycle, you guys know how it is. You, I'm just going to replace one thing. And that one thing just dominoes into a million things. That's exactly what happened. I just wanted to replace brake pads. That was it. It should have been a 20-minute job. It took me four months to get that thing back on the road. 
because I had to go through and replace all the brake lines, all the drums, all the internal parts, like everything had to be redone. And this was one of those parts. And I ordered this brand new uh, online. It came in, it is a, a brake master cylinder. And what this part does, there's a reservoir here that has all your hydraulic fluid. So when you press your brake pedal, it creates pressure in here that goes out to all four wheels to lock your brakes. Well, you have to build pressure in this up first. And for some reason, when I put this thing on, it would not build pressure. I could not figure out why. I thought I was doing something wrong. I thought I missed something. And I spent much racking my brain trying to figure this out. And finally, I got frustrated. And I said, you know what? I'm going to very carefully drive down the street to a shop and let them figure it out for me. 20 minutes later, the guy called me up. Oh, yeah, that thing's defective. It never worked. Brand new out of the box. It was already broken. And I had no idea. So I took it off. It was sitting on my workbench in the garage. Thinking about Lenard Brown, snapped a picture, got my reference, and did this painting. And so this piece is called Defective, because that's exactly what it was, defective right out of the box. Um, very happy to say this piece was featured, I believe it was back in the, in the fall of 21, uh, the uh, National Jury Painting Exhibition at the University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have this piece selected to be part of that exhibition, so very proud of that. Um, Big thanks to them for allowing me to participate. So it was a really, really good show. Uh, <clears throat> moving on, I got these two pieces here. Uh, basic studies. On my way to work every day, I pass a uh, old machine shop in uh, Refugio, and uh, they have these old diesel engines sitting out front, and they're just rusting away. And I thought, man, this thing's so beautiful. It's just that orange and brown, you know, different shapes and colors. And one day I just stopped off on my way home and I took a bunch of pictures of it. So that's where these came from. And I used the indirect painting uh, technique. So I built up a underpainting of brown and then I did my grayscale and I did my glazes. But what I did different on these, when I did my black and gray layer, I purposefully made these marks, these brush strokes very loose. I didn't want to tighten them up. I didn't want them to look 100% photorealistic because Joe was really big about, you know, let a painting look like a painting. You know, if I want a photograph, I'll take a photograph. If I want a copy, I'll just go get a Xerox. But if I want a painting, I want it to look like a painting. And so bearing that in mind, I started going in with these nice fat brush strokes, you know, just really get in there and just put a little pop of white or a little pop of shadow and leave it alone. I didn't try and blend it out. I didn't try and clean it up. I let it dry like that, and then I went over with my color glazes. So that gives it this really nice painterly, loose feel. You know, I did the same thing with this one. This is just an old air cleaner. You know, there's a big air filter inside that thing that looks like uh, Boba Fett's helmet. I had somebody tell me that recently, so uh, always sticks out in my head. But um, same thing, just loose fat brush marks. You know, let them dry, let them be what they are, and then put my glazes on top. <clears throat> Some of the other pieces, aside from oil, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I did printmaking when I was in graduate school uh, under Ryan O'Malley. Uh, this is one of those pieces, it's from 2015. Uh, I call it seeing but not seeing the welder. Uh, and this one came from an experience of my father, you know, being a welder professionally for many years and always financially struggling, you know. He, had to work two jobs for most of my childhood. So he worked at a welding shop or he worked at a mechanic shop during the day. And then at night, you know, he was teaching driver's ed. And on the weekends, he was teaching driver's ed because, you know, we, we struggled. I mean, it was tough. Um, and for all the work my dad did and, and everything that he put in, you know, he wasn't paid enough to be able to make it. He had to do that. And so that's kind of where this came from. You know, they're always willing to give him a pat on the back, but what would have been better than that would be like, hey, a bump in pay would have been nice. You know, a better wage would have been nice versus a, hey, thanks for doing a good job. So that's kind of where this came from. And if you look closely, the welder, the figure is not actually there. The figure is implied solely through the use of the clothing and the welder's helmet and the gloves. But the actual human is not there because they're overlooked, they're overseen. Um, another thing that I experienced, you know, when I was teaching public school, 
Uh, I saw a lot of the vocational classes being defunded or being shut down, being kind of tossed away. And those were important classes. I had a lot of students in my class who were taking edge building or taking wood shop. And they were frustrated because they couldn't, you know, take an advanced class or they couldn't do something more than what was offered because a lot of those classes were kind of being phased out. And I didn't think that was right. So that's kind of where this came from. You know, that was uh, some of my experience. I'll be honest, I don't know how it is now. Uh, it may have changed. That was kind of a little snapshot of that time seven years ago that I experienced. Um, I also like to experiment in different media. Uh, I've gotten really big into uh, wash recently, which is a water-based medium. So that's what this painting is right here. Uh, this was actually a reference photo that a good friend of mine sent to me from, I think he said his father-in-law's farm out in Carnes City. And he just thought that looked really cool. He knew I would appreciate it. So he sent me the image, told me, hey man, I want you to paint something with it. And so that's what I did. I really wanted to try gouache because I've always heard about it, but I never used it. And Joe kind of introduced us to it a little bit. I got to experiment with it. But this is really my, my first one where I went all in and said, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do some really nice gouache pieces. And uh, it's really interesting. I personally never liked watercolor. I always felt that I didn't have the hand for it. Gouache has the qualities of watercolor, but it's very forgiving. And it also has qualities of acrylic. So if you don't like the watercolor side, you can treat it like acrylic and it'll work just the same. So I enjoy that duality of the two. I was able to build this up in really thin washes to get my base colors down and then go in with my thicker layers of paint. So a lot of the oil painting technique that I learned, I could then apply to this new medium and really build it up. And it also allowed me to get some fine detail in here. You know, I could go in with a thin brush and get these little pops of white or these dark shadows or make it look like it was a printed label. So I really enjoyed that. And I called this piece my uncle's place because uh, my uncle has a ranch uh, in North Mission, which I think is now McAllen, Mayberry Road, got annexed, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think that's what happened. So uh, he's a big Ford guy. He's got a tractor out there and it just made me think of his place, you know. So that's why I named it that. It's kind of like in honor of him and, and those memories that I had going to his ranch and seeing old tractors and old cars and hot rods that him and my cousin were putting together and stuff like that. So that's where that piece came from. <clears throat> uh, this one, uh, honestly, I was watching a, a show. Uh, I don't even remember what it was, but there was this really cool uh, shot of a guy welding and it inspired me to do this. I wanted to do something similar. Once again, using the wash, I really wanted to keep pushing myself with this new technique, this new medium. So I did this image of this welder, and I really wanted to play with the light reflecting here versus the contrast of the darker shadows. And the other thing I learned with this one is you can actually go in with wash with color pencil. So in this piece, I built up all my color layers and thin layers and thin washes. Then I went back in with Prismacolor and filled in all my fine details. So when you have a tattoo on the figure's arm, that's all color pencil. Some of the highlights were color pencil. Some of the deep shadow areas were also done with color pencil to kind of help build it up and really build up that surface to make it nice and smooth and help with the blending, that kind of thing. So that idea of mixing mediums, you know, mixing materials, uh, very prevalent in my work because it's very prevalent in my graduate program. You know. The one thing I remember learning there was I'm not a painter, I'm not a draftsman, I'm not a printmaker, I'm an artist. I use a little bit of everything. I might be a 2D artist, I might be a 3D artist, I might be an artist that combines both. At the end of the day, I'm just an artist all around, through and through. So I get to use a little bit of whatever I want to play and make stuff, and, you know, express my ideas and creativity. <clears throat> uh, these last two up here, uh, these are more recent works. Uh, traditional oil on canvas, and once again done in that indirect painting technique of underpainting or sawing glazes. Still trying to keep the loose brush stroke, um, <clears throat> really playing with what Joe called applied detail. So if you look back here, in your mind's eye, you see it, oh, it's a can of bug spray. When you actually look up close, it's just swatches of value and color. That's it. Our mind reads it as, oh, it's a can of Raid or it's a can of, you know, Weedy Gone but it actually isn't, it's just implied. This one was really interesting. Um, 
because I bought a little tabletop vice for my garage. And despite how monumental this thing looks, it's only like three or four inches. I mean, it's a small vice. And it was just kind of funny. Like I saw it online and I thought, oh man, for that price, I get that. It's going to be handy. And I'm thinking, monster nope little itty bitty guy but it does a job you know so i ended up naming it bench vice the mighty i thought that was a, a really fitting name you know to go with it um, and you know just kind of playing with that juxtaposition of what you think something's going to be versus what you actually get in reality of it. you know i thought it was really cool uh, this piece that came about uh, a little over a year ago and uh when I was working on that motor that I mentioned earlier, like I said, I had to get everything brand new. So I had to buy a brand new fuel pump, which is what this central object is, a silver piece. Uh, so that is a close-up view of the side of this motor where the fuel pump bolts on. And once again, I thought that looked really cool and I love the colors, that green, uh, Detroit diesel green is specifically what it is, juxtaposed with the uh, metallic finish and the chrome in the background. So that's where that piece came from. And so same technique, same you know, uh, application of paint and built it up. Uh, funny thing about that one, I was working on that piece as my wife was finishing her degree at a and And so I would go with her at night when she was working on her stuff, getting her final, uh, final critique, and I was working on that. So it was kind of this interesting feeling of I'm back here again, you know, I'm a student again doing this while she's working. And I uh, actually had this idea, I was telling her about I wanted to play a prank on uh, professors and act like I was still there because they looked just so tired at the end of the semester. I wanted to go up to one of them and be like, hey man, I'm ready for my, my committee meeting this afternoon and just see what their reaction would be. You know, just a joke with them a little bit. But uh, it was nice working on that, you know, being back in that class studio setting, you know, uh, that I was used to just from years back. And like I said, really enjoyed it. Really liked playing with the uh, different brush strokes and the textures and trying to capture that feeling of masking tape and uh, the reflection of chrome. I love working with reflective surfaces, and glass, uh, things like that, you know, playing with distorted images. Really pushing myself to try and render them as best as I can. Uh, so that's where that piece came from. And that one I titled uh, Fuelless Pumping Engines. Um, you know, I'm a 90s, 80s, 90s kid, so I grew up with a lot of heavy metal and alternative rock and stuff like that. And that's a line from a Metallica song. And the song itself is about hot rods. And I thought, man, this is perfect. So like, what better way to you know, title it than that? So that's where that piece came from. <clears throat> uh, finally, I've got this large installation over here. Uh, when I was working at Mission, one of my coworkers, uh, was uh, you know, big into airbrushing. And I had done a little bit of airbrushing in undergraduate, so he really got me into it. I started experimenting and doing stuff with it. And then after I left, the grad school kind of stopped. Well, recently I decided, you know what, I want to get back into this again. I liked it before. I had a lot of fun with it. I want to see what I could do. And so I had done some works in graduate school using shop rags for my printing class instead of paper. And I was screen printing on shop rags. And I tried a project where I took an image and I broke it down as a grid and tried to reprint it larger on shop rags. And it didn't work out the way I wanted, but the idea was still there and I wanted to revisit it. So I decided, well, you know, it's through a screen printing, maybe an airbrush would work better. And so that's where this piece came from. And uh, this was actually inspired by a YouTube channel that I like to watch called Iron Trap Garage. And uh, they do a lot of how-to videos this is how to fix this, this is how to like, weld that on a budget. So I thought that was really cool. This was a, a still frame from that. And uh, I follow them on Instagram and I went as far as asking the guy, hey man, I'm an artist, do you mind if I use your likeness for a piece? Like this really inspired me, I wanna do that. He was totally cool about it, he loved the idea. So I did this piece, I did another piece of graphite, uh, ended up giving it to him, I sent it off to him as a gift, to thank him for letting me do that. So that's where this came from. So that's him. Uh, that's the guy in the video, and he's fixing, I think, a piece of line or fuel line or something. And he's using a TIG welder. So he's got the TIG welder nozzle right here. He's got his rod coming through. And then it's just that play of light. The light of the welder contrasting with the dark shadow of everything else. And I really like that idea of the figure 
coming out of the darkness, kind of emerging from the darkness, almost like a sculpture comes out of stone or marble. Um, the shop rags are a really interesting material to work with because they're rags, they're absorbent, they're supposed to be. So what I learned the hard way when I did this piece at work, it looked awesome. And I took it down, and there was a ghost image on the wall right behind it. Uh, nobody told me anything. However, when I came back after summer, my entire classroom had been repainted top to bottom. So I kind of took that as a don't do that again type, type of message. So it's all right. No problem. I'll, I'll put up a board next time in between just to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, but as a result, I really had to go with the layers. I mean, you go an initial coat with this with your black, and it just absorbs and absorbs and absorbs. And finally, it saturates enough that it seals, and then I can keep building my layers from there. Um, same thing with the white. I really had to go over and build that up and take a step back. And, you know, it's still not good enough. So I'm going to keep hitting it, building it up from there. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Did a couple of experiments first to kind of get the hang of it, get back into the of it. But uh, this is definitely something I want to continue to pursue. I've got ideas other images that I like to do larger than this. So each rag is roughly like a one square foot. So this is three by four. I've got some that I want to do like five by four, eight by 10, you know, that kind of thing, just large pieces. And the really cool thing about this is it is so easy to transport because I can stack them all in a box and just drop them off like that. And all I need to do is incorporate installation instructions with how do they all go together, where do they fit, that's it. So, you know, the ability to create something so large that's so lightweight and so easily transportable is a big, big benefit. Um, I learned the hard way in, in school that, yeah, it's great to make big pieces, but good luck trying to transport them. I mean, unless you have a van or something, it's it's a challenge. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where I started staying with these. 16 by 20s, 20 by 24s, 24 by 30, you know, kind of standard sizes, because it's just easy to hang, easy to transport. I can frame it if I want to. I can gallery wrap if I don't want to frame, and it works out great, you know. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a rundown of the show and the different pieces in the show. So definitely, you know, where my heart's at right now. Um, some ideas that I want to keep pursuing or I want to start pursuing. You know, I've got an idea, a uh, good friend of mine, you know, always uses the phrase, you know, the, the chicanazo, the improvised fix. And I really like that. I, I relate to that a lot because I saw that a lot growing up. You know, the person who goes out there with some duct tape and zip ties, you know, uh, rigs something up and makes it work. You know, that kind of ingenuity and creativity to be able to think on the fly and use what materials are available, I think is really interesting. So I started some new words kind of, talking about that idea um, and i'm still working with the same materials I'm working with wash still working with oils still working with airbrush uh, the one that i really got back or really uh started doing again recently is scratch board you know plain simple scratch board working with contrast of black and white highlights darks and everything in between uh, using that kind of imagery you know so i want to see where this goes i really want to pursue it and, and see what develops from that I think it's a really good, you know, topic because it's just, I've never seen it, you know, artistically depicted that kind of ingenuity and creativity, you know, from stuff that you wouldn't think of. But uh, like I said, it's what I experienced you know, growing up. And my cousin, you know, who, who lives on the corpus is the exact same way. I mean, it was always fun having him around because he'd be like, hey man, I'm, I'm having trouble trying to fix this. And he'd come over with like chewing gum and a snorkel and some zip ties and Oh man, like magic, this thing was working again. You know, it was amazing to see that. So um, that's kind of where I'm going for the future and uh, see where it takes me. Uh, other than that, I guess go ahead and start opening it up to questions. For anybody that's logged on, anybody wants to type in a question, by all means, guys, feel free. Uh, I'll answer it as best as I can. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, how has your art making changed since when you started college to now that you're a professor and teaching? Uh, definitely technique has changed. Um, 
when I was an undergraduate, I did a lot of drawing with ink and charcoal and acrylic painting. I was primarily an acrylic painter. Um, as the years progressed, I just kind of started picking up a lot of different techniques. Uh, when I was teaching at the high school, uh, I really started to develop my acrylic technique and, and got into this idea of using layers. You know, before I would just lay on thick, heavy coats of paint to try and get my color. And then I learned that, you know what, I could build this up gradually on the surface and get a beautiful effect. So that definitely changed. Um, taking a class, you know, I mentioned Leonard Brown earlier. Um, when I took a class with him, I think back in 2005, that's when I was introduced to this idea of working thematically and creating fine art. Because before then, I, I wanted to be basically an illustrator. I wanted to either illustrate comics or I wanted to do tattoos or, you know, anything that was going to get me to draw. And then Brown really talked to me about, well, no, like, do something you're passionate about. You know, when you're doing tattoos, you're doing comics, you're doing stuff for other people. It's not your work. You finish it, you give it away, you never see it again. When you do this, this is your subject matter, your, uh, your vision, your ideas. And so that really helped me develop as an artist. Um, and then getting into graduate school, I learned more techniques, you know, became a more proficient printmaker, I felt more confident working in the print shop. Um, obviously made the jump into oils and just really enjoyed it, you know, under Joe's tutelage. And more than that, I learned how to develop my ideas with a strong conceptual background. You know, how can I create this and then have a historical tie to it? Like I could look at this piece and somebody might think, oh, well, that's just a motor. You know, that's just a, it's a wall piece. And I'm thinking, well, actually, no, it's not. Like this ties into guys like Red Grooms, who would do these, you know, 3D paintings that would come off the wall. And they were like dioramas, you know, with different kinds of materials. Um, you know, this ties into social realism from the 30s. You know, Thomas Hart Benton and the Works Program Administration during the Depression. Like, there's so many historical connections that I know because I took those classes and I learned all about that. So it really strengthened my conceptual background to what it is that I wanted as an artist. <clears throat> I work with a group of ladies who are fiber artists. Okay. They would just be blown away by painting on the, the, the oil cloths and the, um, the depth of color you got there because that's what they're about. Mm -hmm. Some people would refer to them as quilters, which they are not. They're fiber artists and they're trying to push the limits on everything. I'm really excited that. Tell them to get over here and see that. <laughs> because you. Um, they have figured out that just about anything is an art material. Oh, yeah. And uh, even, you know, stuff that other people are throwing away and uh, or discarding, I should say. But uh, that's just amazing to me. Is there any under painting, any gesso, anything you do to stabilize the cloth? Or is it, if you picked it off there, the only thing is cloth and oil paint? That's basically it. So in that case, the, <clears throat> uh, the pigment I use is actually water-based uh, because it's just easier to keep clean through the airbrush. It's easier to dilute. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have to worry about like, using any kind of solvents or putting a support on the, uh, on the rag itself. So it's just straight on there. Um, I imagine... If I were to use like a like a spray sealer, like a spray varnish, that might seal the rag up a little better. My only concern with that is um, there would definitely be a smell to it, and it might make them kind of stiff and fragile. So they still have some. Oh yeah. Like okay. There's a lot of pliabilities. You can take them; they'll fold up, they'll roll up. Like, you know, they're they're perfectly fine. Um, and when I did screen prints on them, it was the same thing. Now, I will say this, the benefit of doing a screen print on this material is because the screen print ink is so heavy and so thick, it'll coat it in one shot. So one, two passes with my screen printer, I can pull it up and I got a perfect image. It just really depends on the quality of the image that I render to do it. But in this case, like I said, I really had to build it up and build it up and build it up. It took some time to be able to get it that, that dark and then make the highlights that strong. Second question. You talked about an iron-based uh, paint that you let rust. Is it on any of these others? 
And then the center one? Uh, just the center one. Um, when I made these five sculptural pieces, they were the ones that had that. Uh, one other thing I did do I didn't talk <clears> about <throat> was uh, I was actually using motor oil in my painting medium. So I had a whole series of- Of course, it's, it's mechanical, it's exactly. motor oil. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I had these large canvases that I made and they were raw canvases, there was no gesso on them. And I would stain them and drip them or I'd drop them off at like local mechanic shops and let them mark them up. And then I would put a clear gesso on top of that and then paint my image. So that was another idea that I was doing for a while. I did a whole bunch of those. Uh, a couple of those were in my MFA show. Uh, but from there, it translated to this. And then I can't remember how I found out about that paint. It was just one of those things I came across and I thought, man, that would be really cool. So I ordered some and tried it out. I really liked it. So all the sculptural ones had it. I had two canvas pieces that had the, the actual stains of oil transmission fluid and boot prints on them and stuff like that. Uh, and then everything else was uh, more traditional, you know, uh, painting techniques, that kind of thing, or, or prints. So. Have you tried using like a rust as a paint? Yeah, I mean, rust? Actual rust? I have not. I've heard of people doing that. Yeah. Um, I haven't done it myself, but it'd be something to try for sure. Yeah, there was an artist a few years back at Peter Library mm -hmm. who she specialized in like the little rust of painting. Yeah. Like strictly rust, the good flowers. Oh wow. But the rust was kind of aspect of the agent. Yeah. So was she was she taking it and mixing it into her paints or, or how was she using it? I think so like like she had some process where she would uh like a plain white paper, mm -hmm. like so molded, but it was 100% rust. Oh, wow. Like the flowers and mushrooms. Yeah, that is interesting. But rust would be nice with the molded. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd heard of people doing stuff like that, like grinding it up and adding it to their pigments or adding it to the medium. But that idea of using it to create these organic forms, that's really interesting. Is it something man made and synthetic to make something natural? So, uh, pretty cool. I'll have to check that out. So, uh, any other questions? Um, I feel like there's kind of two schools of thought uh, in art or with artists. There's one that thinks, you know, you just are born an artist and you paint and you don't really need an education. And then other people are, you know, will only hire MFAs. Um, what do you think is the best reason to go to school if you're gonna be an artist? Okay. I would say the best reason is feedback. Um, you know, in the digital age, I've heard the phrase, the university of YouTube, you, know, you can learn anything on YouTube. It's not entirely untrue. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can learn, myself included. I've learned a lot of things just by logging into YouTube. But what I didn't get from it was feedback. Um, you know, the engine project I talked about, I learned a lot of that from YouTube. But that didn't mean that when I was out there in the garage, I made a bunch of mistakes and had to go back and do double or sometimes even triple the work because I didn't have somebody there looking over my shoulder and just kind of checking in, periodically, hey man, are you sure you want to do that? Or you know what, before you do that, take care of this first or else you're gonna have issues. So it's the same thing with going to art school, you know. Um, you're gonna get the feedback from your instructors. More than anything, you're gonna get the feedback from your classmates. I think personally, that is extremely valuable. Uh, of the times I was in school at both UTPA and TANUCC, what I really valued the most was the feedback of my classmates more than anything. And nothing against the instructors. I mean, I valued them too. They knew what they were doing. But that peer-to-peer -peer interaction was so important and so helpful in a lot of what I did uh, as an artist and now as an art educator. Um, the networking you get from it is, is another thing. Honestly, like that's the way the world is. That's the way it works. You know, you get to know these people, you work with them day in, day out. And then when you graduate, when you graduate, you get out in the world and you start looking for a job. That network is an extremely helpful and beneficial to you. You know, I have classmates that are professors all over the country now because of my time in graduate school. That had I not gone, I wouldn't have had that. So I would say those are the big benefits. You know, having 
a formal foundational background is also very beneficial because if you want to go and do really, you know, on the edge type stuff and break all the rules, you now have the education to back that up. You have the education to tell, tell you what rules you can break, what rules you can bend versus going into a blind, you know, and nothing against the people that do that, but you definitely want to give yourself as many tools and as many chances as you can. That's for sure my thoughts on that. Follow up on yes. that. Yes. Toughest question I ever had a student ask me was, when can I start calling myself an artist? Ah. So, question to you is, so when did you look in the mirror and say, I'm here, I'm an artist? I don't know. I will be totally honest with you. Um, This student, by the way, was eighth grade. Ah, okay. I don't know. I, I wouldn't say for me it was a distinct moment. Um, I guess in my case, it was something I always felt that I had to do. So in my own way, I guess I always kind of was. But now that I've got the education and the career, you know, I can more confidently say, no, this is, this is it versus when I was younger, more like, this is what I'm working towards. This is what I want to be. Um, as far as like any milestones, getting the degrees was one where I felt like, okay, now I have the paper. I can back it up. I'm, I'm a trained artist. Getting to shows, I think is another one, which uh, for students is extremely important. You know, apply to shows, submit work, you know, even if it's your local coffee shop, I mean, Talk to them, get it out there. My first ever solo exhibition was at a coffee shop in Corpus. And it came about because I just walked in one day and I just asked them, hey, guys, you guys have art. Who do I need to talk to to maybe display some stuff? And they gave me the info. And three months later, they called me, hey, man, we're going to give you the month of August. You got a show. And it just went from there. Um, you know, but basically being able to, I think, have something to show for what you're doing. You know, uh, I know my instructors are really big about, it's not enough just to say it, you know, you gotta be able to back it up in some way, shape or form. So I think once I started doing that, the confidence builds and I feel like, okay, no, I'm, I am an artist and you know what, I've got the resume to prove, I can back it up. Which is your favorite piece? Had to hang one in your bedroom and look at it every morning first thing. Which one would you pick? I don't know, darling. Which one am I allowed to, which yeah. one should I put up? <laughs> next, next to our portrait. Uh, next to the wedding picture, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of partial to that one. I really love those greens, like I said. Uh, I really like that engine one because I did that one recently and it was just, I love the size of it, but I don't have it anymore. I can always make another, that's right. Nothing's <laughs> precious. Uh, and probably this one. This one I actually normally keep in my office at work. So that's that's where that one tends to hang most of the time. I brought it down for the show. Uh, I don't know, I might say yeah, probably those three and then probably the one up top, the, the down up view of the old truck. Uh, that one I did not do in traditional technique. That one was actually just straight color. So, you know, the brush strokes are just a little bit different. If you look closely at it, you can tell the difference. You know, that one I didn't do, a, a, I did an underpainting, but I didn't do a gray layer. So I did from my brown wash straight into my yellows and my blues and everything else. So, which I'll admit was a little difficult because yellow is just so transparent. I mean, you really got to kick it on there to build it up. And there's no values underneath. Can I you also use the brown? Yeah, same thing. Yeah, I did the, the brown wash. It's just, it's very light, you know, just to kind of get a, a sense of where everything's going to be. And then I can go back over with my color or my black and gray scale if I want to go that route. Did you talk about troubleshooting? Oh, yes. Yes, I forgot about that. Thank you. So this piece actually has some issues. There's some 
marks underneath that's the underside of that hood and it's old i mean this is 70 years old 60 something years old whatever and it's a big solid steel hood and it's got this framing underneath i just could not get that perspective right I mean, it just kept looking crooked it kept looking off it was very frustrating and you know, i remember uh, christina was telling me once she was looking at it uh, that doesn't look right you need to fix that you need to fix that so i had to go in as much as it killed me, I'd already done like 60, 70% of it. I had to go back and whitewash that one section and then build it back in. But I'm glad I did because I fixed it, I corrected it, now it looks right. If I had been stubborn and said, ah, I don't want to deal with it, nobody will notice, it would have been bugging me. So don't be afraid to do that, guys. You know, students that are watching, something's bugging you, just fix it. Don't worry about it. You know, our instructors always used to tell us nothing is precious. You can always make it again. That is so true. I can always make another one. It's not a big deal. I take a little bit more time. That's it. It's uh, one last question. You mentioned sure. um, you mentioned Instagram earlier mm -hmm. and being able to sell a piece across the United States. Um, how important do you think maintaining a, a online presence is for artists nowadays? Uh, I would say it's very important. Um, everything's digital. You know, uh, when I was looking for jobs, a lot of those jobs are online application only. You know, you're not doing a paper copy anymore. A lot of them are asking, you know, in lieu of an actual portfolio, send me a website link. And it's kind of tough if you don't have that, uh, if you don't have some kind of online presence. I know for me and my experiences, I've had that art Instagram for about four and a half years, give or take. It really has been helpful. I mean, I've gotten commissions. People have just contacted me. Hey, man, I want you to do this for me. Uh, I've had people buy my work that I've already got. You know, like I mentioned, that piece sold. You know, I had some drawings sell. Um, I'll do studies. Like I thing, I post everything I'm working on. So. I've literally done small sketches just for fun in color pencil or water or uh, gouache. And somebody will see, hey man, how much do you want for that? It's just to say, oh, I really like it. I don't want it. You know, name, name your price. Okay. You know, whatever, whatever they like. So it helps. It's it's very valuable. It's a helpful tool. I mean, that's this is the digital age. This is what we do now. So I would definitely encourage it. If you, you know, those of you that are watching, if you haven't done that yet, get some kind of online presence you know an extra tool in the box exactly okay well if nobody has any other questions then uh thank you jason for being with us here today and have a good day you too thank you thank you everybody for tuning in appreciate it